Imagine, you've just settled into your seat in a beautiful theater. Everyone is dressed to the nines, waiting for the lights to dim so they can hear the dazzling sounds of a world-renowned orchestra. The conductor does that tap thing on her podium as a clarinet tunes to a bee and silence blankets the crowd. She raises her arms to lead the orchestra in their first piece, and the first note sounds like a collection of wounded pigeons. Now this doesn't typically happen. Instead, you'd be riveted by some incredible music. So how does an orchestra perform together to make music? How does a conductor manage all those different parts of a whole to give the listener that perfect experience? The answer lies in something called systems theory. In the words of the Beatles, systems theory is how all the parts come together. It's about looking at organizations through the lens of interrelationships of structures and components rather than simple linear cause and effect. At a high level, systems theory essentially looks like this diagram. In every system, there are inputs that feed the processes which produce outputs within a given environment. How each of the processes, subsystems, components, etc., work together to produce outputs is systems theory. When you think about an orchestra, each of the different sections could be considered their own subsystem, and how they work together to produce music would be their processes. Applying systems theory to an orchestra would allow us to analyze why they're struggling to perform a piece by both hearing the ensemble as a whole and by breaking down the orchestra into their sections to understand the musical relationships that may be causing dissonance. Organizations are also systems. They have their subsystems, which could include work units, departments, divisions, etc. And any organization that gives and takes information from the surrounding environment is considered an open system. Wait, what exactly do you mean by an open system? Let's go back to our orchestra. There are all sorts of variables pressing upon a system. This could include how hot the stage lights are while they're performing, maybe the funding that they're receiving, or even the crowd response. And those are just the things that the system receives. The orchestra also has internal variables, like how much the individuals or sections practice, the leadership, the culture, and the human and section capabilities. That's a lot of moving parts. It's a wonder any band sounds good ever. Even David Bowie wrote a whole song about how hard change is. Similarly, in your organization, think about all the different variables that press upon it and what may be going on within it. This is why change is way easier said than done. A change in any part of the system inevitably changes another part of the system. It's critical to apply systems thinking throughout your improvement project. However, there are definitely some key places where without systems theory, the project could hit some major roadblocks later on. First, in the scoping phase, deciding who should be included in your team as stakeholders, etc., is really critical. Excluding someone could mean missing a section in your musical ensemble. Imagine listening to techno without a bass line. Second, during process and gap analysis, it's important to explore every angle when doing improvement. If you ignore the variables within a system or those pressing upon it, you likely will miss a critical gap later on. In the operations handoff, double check that you've spoken to those who will be receiving your process outputs. Does the improved output work for them? But before we jump into trying to solve all the organizational and system problems, one question you should ask yourself is, should I? Swanson's taxonomy of performance helps us answer that question. In this model, Swanson breaks down the different types of problems facing a system and articulates well how to solve them with the appropriate tools. Feel free to pause here if you'd like to take a closer look. It's important to discern whether a problem really falls into the category of maintaining a system or changing a system. Way too often do organizational problems fall within the maintaining bucket. This includes things like troubleshooting, operating, and understanding. So how do we go about solving a systems problem? Well, unlike Leonard Skinner, Swanson and Holton like to ask some fundamental questions for engaging in systems thinking. They are first, what is the name and purpose of the system? Let's say a unit is trying to discharge their patients more efficiently. They may name this process after the purpose and call it the discharge process. However, if we use systems theory, we would need to ask what the downstream stakeholders think of this process and name. Though a patient is leaving one unit, the next area required to care for them may have a totally different idea of the purpose and therefore its name. The second question is what are the parts or elements of the system? People often only see through their perspectives for organization and system-wide problems, and it's critical to understand all perspectives. The third question is, what are the relationships between the parts? Swanson and Holton call this the real magic of systems theory, analyzing the relationships between the parts and the impact of those relationships. Okay, but that third step, the magic, how do we do that? Well, you can really use just about any improvement model to solve a systems problem at this level. However, you have to break it down by looking inward 
to the subsystems and outward to the environment. Here's an example where we applied this. During the pandemic, supply chain, like everyone's, had to figure out a new way of managing the plethora of supply shortages. But solving this problem wasn't going to be something we could simply root cause and say, well, that's just the pandemic's fault, so let's just fix that. The team spent a couple of weeks focused on those first two questions as part of their scoping phase, but it proved to be challenging. Where did the process for responding to product shortages start? When the team was notified of an item on back order? When we realized we were getting low on product? What about where the process ended? Was it once we received the product that was on back order into inventory? Or was it all the way to the product being used in surgery? This system clearly was really tough to define. And every stakeholder had a different perspective of the bookends of the process and the critical variables, both in and outside of the system. Frankly, it was a lot to sort through. But we used basic consensus building tools like a project charter and an A3 to help us tease out the problem we wanted to solve, our scope, and the purpose of the system and the components within it. After that, we went through the following process in a workshop developed by Rumler and Braish. This decision tree has the team discern if the root of the gap is an organizational problem, process problem, or individual or job level problem. We looked at the system, which included all the processes from identifying a shortage had happened through to stocking a substitute product at the point of use. For each process or subsystem within the system, we asked the team if it was currently capable or had gaps indicated by the little red flag shown here. Notice that this diagram is organized in what we call the SIPOC, which stands for Suppliers, Inputs, Processes, Outputs, and Customers. You can see the red flags tend to be concentrated on the internal and external variable side. And the gaps can be thought of as constraints created by these variables. As we found gaps, we ran through the Rumler and Braish model to identify organizational, process, and individual or job level gaps. Here are some examples. A supply chain organizational gap was that shortages were being managed through firefighting by everyone. The team decided it would be best to have a cross-functional central team manage the shortages as they came in. A process gap we identified is that all items are treated as critical items, and we needed a method to prioritize them based on the acuity of the patient, stock on hand, urgency of the case, etc. An individual or job gap we identified was that often people were doing things way outside of their scope to solve a shortage. Our team restructured the roles involved in managing shortages to ensure that each team knew how to handle the product shortage in case someone got sick. We came out of this workshop with a planned set of activities and solutions in order to make the response to shortages more reliable. Since this project, we've seen a significant reduction in internal stockouts. Now I'd like to introduce a colleague of mine, Dustin, to speak on how he utilizes systems theory. He's the manager of demand planning in supply chain. So when we were, for example, working on the shortages project, we made sure to include every group that is going to be involved in it, get their perspective, make sure that they were involved in process mapping, every aspect of it, and that they gave us their opinion and that we gave space to go back and forth and disagree so at the, at the end of the day, we had a fully fleshed out process. Systems thinking is helpful when you have a lot of stakeholders, when you have a very complex problem, uh, when past attempts to solve it individually or in silos haven't really addressed it. Um, that's when you need to pause all of those groups, bring them together, get solid engagement from them, and then have a plan at the end of the work that you're doing to address everything. Um, taking that time and getting them all involved really is the only way to have a good process. Otherwise, it's siloed and it will continue to be uh, an issue. Let's summarize the key takeaways for systems thinking. Systems are a collection of their components that are all interconnected with each other in a nuanced way. Systems can and should be named and identified by their purpose first, then analyzed at the organization, process, and individual level. For each level of analysis, any process improvement model can be used. Keep people, and specifically the right people, engaged. That you may not like all the other groups that you work with, and you're probably spending more time doing your work than you should be doing. And if you can just stop what you're doing and be aware of the other groups that you're working with, hear them out, work with them to establish a process together. You're gonna to save each other time, you're gonna to work together better, you're gonna be more efficient, and you're gonna be happier. I hope this video, like Casey and the Sunshine Band, helped you wrap your arms around your systems problem. 
Thank you so much for watching, and may these songs and key points be stuck in your head for the foreseeable future.